Y'all can turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. While you're turning there, I, I did want to mention a couple other things that uh, perhaps should have been mentioned uh, in the announcements, but uh, it's certainly a request uh, likewise for uh, prayers. Uh, we uh, today will be sending uh, many of our <coughs> young ones uh, and likewise some of our uh, more, uh, well, some of our older folks uh, to camp uh, for the second uh, and final week uh, of camp uh, of this year, uh, 2012, uh, and then immediately following uh, that week of camp, or the Monday following that week of camp, we are sending uh, our mission team uh, to Mexico to build houses uh, for about a week. So uh, it's going to be a busy couple weeks uh, for a lot of folks uh, from the congregation here. So uh, pray diligently uh, that all will go well with uh, both of those weeks, uh, both of those uh, outreaches that we have uh, in uh, our community, uh, in this world, uh, and pray that God's will uh, will certainly be done in all uh, of those things. In the book of First John, <clears throat> in the book of First John, chapter two, verse uh, fifteen through seventeen, John writes this. He says, "Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust." of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the world is passing away and the <clears throat> lust uh, of it. But he who does the will of God abides in him forever. These are verses that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this morning's lesson. We're kind of in the middle of a series of lessons talking about what it means to be spiritual. Well, what it means to acknowledge that we are multifaceted beings. In other words, you're more than just a body. You're more than just a mind. Now, on certain levels, we, we recognize this. And at certain times, people have said things like, you know, don't judge me because of the, the way I think, or don't judge me because of the way I, I look. We realize that we are multifaceted individuals made up of various parts and that God has made us that way. You have a body that has strength, that has ability, that has potential, that is certainly blessed. You likewise have a mind. Have a mind. You have desires. You have will. And then you have this soul, or the Bible uses the word soul to describe the, the holistic picture of who you are. And the fact that you are in this world and you are an animated figure. We talked about spiritual formation. How it is that we can get in touch with that side of who we are that connects us to God. We talked about the spiritual anatomy that wake, makes us up. And likewise, last week we talked about being spiritually connected to God and how that actually happens. And the fact that, to kind of sum it up in that nutshell form, it's going to require some effort on our part. It's going to require that you often step out of your comfort zones. And it's going to require, as we will talk about this morning, that you are willing, <clears throat> because God has made you able to overcome spiritual hurdles that are often going, <clears throat> that are often going to be part of your spiritual life. And I make no mistake about it. When we talk about spiritual hurdles, and many times we're talking about things that are unseen. We're talking about things that, that are oftentimes unseen and yet at the same time produce the greatest amount of effect that we have in our life. Sometimes when we talk about spiritual hurdles, hurdles, we're talking about the fact that you are perceiving certain events, certain things, certain people, certain places in a particular way. See, there are things that will bother the child of God and will be hurdles to us. That will not be perceived as such by the world. Just like John said, there, there are two different groups of people who live in this world. There are those who are on the side of God, who have a love for God and God abiding in them. Then there are those who are in love with the things of the world. And they allow the things of the world to come to abide and to remain inside of them. So we see from very different perspectives. So when we talk about these hurdles, when we talk about these challenges, we have to realize first and foremost that 
while God has tuned us to see them, it may very well be the case that we are not yet of such a spiritual formation that we can see them. Kind of like operating as a person in this world who needs glasses and yet doesn't have them. We just simply don't see those things. Or they're not very clear to us. Anybody ever try to get a permit from a city to do something? Yeah, a lot of you probably know that we're trying to put up a a fence at at the church house. Trying to put up a fence at the church house. And and let me say this up front. If you don't live in Pinellas Park, you probably have it a lot rougher. Pinellas Park is is pretty easy, actually, to to work with, especially when you have someone who knows people, right? It's one of those things. But Pinellas Park is pretty simple to to deal with, uh, as opposed to other places where I've tried to get other permits. So I don't want to make it sound worse than than it is, especially leveling anything against the city in which we live. But getting a permit to do something is difficult. To try to put in a fence can sometimes be a, a difficult, if not frustrating, thing. You walk into the office and you tell them what you want to do and then the next thing you know you've got a stack of paperwork. And not only do you have that stack of paperwork but you come to find out that the property that you want to put a fence on is actually not your property. It's part of the city's property or an easement. So you now have to file this other set of paperwork. And you've got to call all of these utilities and these utilities have to write all of these letters saying that they don't have a problem with you putting the fence there. And several months later You finally get all that paperwork together and you take it in and you're looking at the paperwork and you're looking at all of your effort and you're thinking, man, what a mess. Does it really have to be this difficult? I mean, does it really have to be this much of a challenge just to go to the store and buy a fence and put it in? Why does it have to be so hard? But if you give it any kind of thought at all, you realize why it has to be that way. See, because if it weren't that way, then there would be nothing to stop your neighbor. There'd be nothing to stop your, your neighbor who just so happens to, you know, like, uh, you know, drinking this Budweiser, to one weekend put up a fence made nothing of Budweiser cans. Twelve foot high, two feet thick, and then sit out there with no shirt on in his driveway saying, yeah, look at my fence. Or there'd be nothing to stop the neighbor on the other side of you from going down to the local place where they're clearing that land to put up that new condo, to get that junk and that brush that they pushed into a pile, and to simply pile it up in a 12 to 15 foot high high pile around the border, some on your property, and to take all of his other junk and toss it up there and make himself a fence. You see, it's there for a reason. There are some hurdles you have to go through. There are some hurdles you have to jump in order to be able to put in a simple fence. But I tell you what, they're worth it. In the long run, they make sense. One of the issues of Christianity that we so often struggle with is the fact that much of the process of growth and spiritual development has these similar frustrations, these similar anxieties. I mean, if we're genuinely trying to grow spiritually, we're going to come up against these things and we're going to wonder why. And then we're going to further wonder, why is it so difficult? I mean, why do I have a hard time picking up the Bible and just simply reading it and studying it? I see old Joe over here. Man, he does it. And he sits in the class every Sunday and he spouts off these Greek words and this Hebrew that and commentary this and... Why is it so easy for him? Why is it so hard for me? I think sometimes we expect it to be easy because we're dealing with things that are spiritual. I mean, we're not dealing with things that are physically hard to move. We're not dealing with things that that fall in this realm where the, the exhausting part of our efforts often go, the physical part of it. Why we would think it would be any less difficult in spiritual realms is simply beyond me. I mean, you think about it for a minute. Developing yourself spiritually is not the same as building a fence, right? Is it difficult to put a fence up? 
Anybody ever put a fence up? Yeah, it's not a real easy thing to do, right? I mean, if you're going to do it correctly, I mean, sure, you could do it, you know, incorrectly. I mean, you could dig a few holes and, yeah, they kind of line up and you could throw some posts in there and well, they're kind of straight and you can nail some things to it and says, it kind of looks good. I mean, if you're going to do it right, then you've got to take some measurements. You've got to level up those poles. You've got to make sure they're the right distance apart. You've got to make sure you have the right materials. You've got to make sure that, you know, all the angles are correct. It's going to take a lot of work. And yet, it's still not as difficult as spiritual formation. And here's why. Because when we're dealing with spiritual formation, we're dealing with things like correcting your attitude. Ah, anybody ever do that? Anybody ever have a bad attitude about something? Yeah, I'm sure you have. I mean, I have. I'm sure, I, well, anyhow. I mean, most of us have. A bad attitude about something. Anybody ever try to, you know, reestablish a core belief? I mean, take the simple notion of faith in God. Ask yourself the three simple questions. What do I believe? Why do I believe it? And whom do I believe? Give yourself the answer to those questions. I mean, are they your core? Is it your core? Is it your default setting? Let's put it that way, since we live in a computerized world. Is it our default setting to be forgiving and merciful and kind and open-minded and benevolent? I mean, are those our default settings? When we come up against the people in the world who are, who are struggling, maybe because of their own fault, how do we treat them? What is our attitude toward them? These are the things that we're trying to form when we go through this spiritual growth process. You're trying to change the heart of you by allowing God into your heart so that He can be the one that shapes you. I mean, are we convinced like Paul that our present struggle is nothing compared to the weight of glory that awaits us? In other words, Paul says, these physical things that happen to me in this world, they're nothing compared to the spiritual things. So it shouldn't really get on us too much. It shouldn't really take us too much by surprise when there's difficulty in establishing ourselves in spiritual realms. Now all of this kind of implies something that, that is not often received with a great amount of pleasantness or open arms. That is that spiritually there's going to be struggle. You and I are in a race, but we're not racing a race that is free, or we're not on a course that is free of obstacles. If you go over in your Bibles, and hold your place there in Hebrews, you can go over and, and if you want to, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14. And in these verses and the verses that surround it, Christ is talking about the way to destruction and the way to eternal life. And he spells it out pretty clearly, right? I mean, as clear as any road sign could get it. He spells it out for us and even tells us what we're going to experience along the way. I mean, I wish I had this much instruction in some of the trips that I've taken in the past. No map, not knowing where I'm going. Kind of blind to what's between point A and point B. But God gives pretty clear instructions here. And one of the things he says is that the road to glory is straight and it's narrow. It's straight and, and it's narrow. Now, the word straight can be translated as difficult. But I, I like what Mickelson's Greek dictionary says about it. it. It says, narrow from obstacles standing near. In other words, as you traverse this road, this spiritual highway, moving evermore towards God, Mile marker after mile marker. And those mile markers, by the way, are markers of your spiritual growth. If you're not growing, you're still at mile one. 
You know, time passing doesn't move you from mile marker to mile marker. Your continual growth is what moves you from mile one to mile eternity. There are many, many obstacles. Paul discusses this with the Hebrews. You're probably thinking, man, it's about time he got the Hebrews. Paul discusses this with the Hebrews. And probably there, there's no better people to actually discuss it with. I don't know if you realize this or not, but, but the book of Hebrews, for the most part, is one gigantic argument. It's one gigantic argument broken into various pieces, all designed to convince the Hebrew brothers and sisters in Christ that Christ was worth sticking with. Don't go back to Judaism because you have a few hurdles in your way. What were their hurdles? Well, some of them were being killed because Christians were persecuted. Some of them were being beaten. Some of them were being stoned. They were certainly being looked down upon and criticized and ridiculed and scoffed at. So let's not be too hard on the Hebrew brethren here. But let's take their example and certainly learn from it. Paul, in the first few chapters, chapters 8, all the way up to chapters 8, chapter 9, is giving these arguments for why Christ is better. Why Christ is better. Better priesthood. Better promises. Better covenant. Then he gets up to chapter 11. And he wants to encourage these brethren by talking about these great heroes of faith. And he goes through all the way back into the Old Testament and he walks them through history using these individual characters and telling them, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Isaac, by faith, Sarah, by faith, by faith, by faith. These people did what Christ is asking you to do now. Endure and grow in your spirituality. By faith they moved mountains, they changed kingdoms. We can even add to it if we wanted to. Make up our own little list of just New Testament history up to this point. By faith. A man named John stood at the foot of the cross when everyone else fled to hear the final words of Christ. By faith, those men assembled in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost to see the Spirit come with power. And thousands were converted because they chose to do so. On and on we could go. And he tells them, by faith, these people accomplished great things through spiritual growth and movement. And he brings it home in chapter 12. He says, therefore, we also... We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin <clears throat> which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, Lest you become weary and discouraged in your, what's it say? Souls. That's what we've been talking about. Lest you become worried, or excuse me, lest you become wearied and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastity. The chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Three points, three trials, three hurdles I want to mention. Just three things. Chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him who endures such hostility from sinners against himself. Hurdle number one, outward hostility. Outward hostility. Most of us probably understand this. Maybe not to the point that maybe they did. But if we're standing up for Christ, if we're trying to grow spiritually, if we're doing those things that we've talked about in past lessons, the prayer, the meditation, the reading of God's word, the, 
the creation of relationships between his children and between him. And I would dare say people are going to take notice of that. And you know what? Sometimes in this world, people can be very unkind when they see things of that nature. Christ promised that. I don't know if you realize that, but Christ promised. How many times did he say you are going to be persecuted? Simply for being a child of God, you are going to be persecuted. Save your place, Hebrews chapter 12. Go back to the book of Matthew. Back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. 10 and 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 9. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And if you don't believe Matthew, go over to the book of Luke. Book of Luke chapter uh, 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. <clears throat> Blessed are you when men hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. And go over to the book of John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. <clears throat> this is, of course, the chapter where he has that famous discussion about the true vine. Chapter 15, verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, yet... Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. A couple more. Go forward to 17, chapter 17, and read with me verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Christ is in the midst of his high priestly prayer here. He's praying to God, and he says, God, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, for I am not of the world. And folks, I'll have you know that that's just a sampling. We've only touched three of the gospel accounts. This doesn't include all of the other times that this is said by other people in the New Testament. John alludes to in 1 John in the passage that we opened with. You're in one group or the other. And this group over here, because you're in this group here, they're not going to like you too much. They're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. So we have this outward hostility. The Bible tells us all about it. So we ought not think it's strange. When even our, our own governments create policies that are unfriendly to Christians. We ought not be shocked and appalled when people who are caught up in the systems and the governments of the world say, Hey, you Christian people, you're kind of the last on our list. Or you're not on our list at all. Outward hostility has always been with us, but we must endure. Turn, turn back over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, just read very quickly verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that murderer ha no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. There's always going to be hostility. Just like there will always be a right and a wrong. And I would hope that we would choose the right path and the right way that leads to that eternity that John speaks of. The world may take your money, may take your status, may take your family, may take your friends, but it cannot take your convictions. It cannot take the core of who you are that you slowly form over a lifetime that leads you to eternity. Maybe to sum it up best, just simply use the words of Christ. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, he says, Do not fear those that can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Don't fear them. I don't know if you realize this or not, but fear in the Bible has a couple of different meanings. You know, when it talks about especially things like, you know, uh, the fear of God is the beginning of, sometimes wisdom, sometimes knowledge. It's talking about the, the awesomeness of God. 
and the reverential attitude we ought to have toward him. When Christ says, do not fear those who can kill the body, perhaps he's alluding to both of those ideas. We shouldn't quake and tremble in the presence of, uh, of powers that are part of this world because we know a higher power. At the same time, we shouldn't pay reverence to them either or see them as the most awesome feature of the land. By considering constantly the struggle of Christ, we can take heart. We can take heart. That's what Paul says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Interesting language he uses here. The word souls here is the word suke, which some versions translate a a little bit different. Some versions say your minds. Literally, the word means breath. Breath. But the words leading up to it are kind of interesting. Faint-hearted is a word that simply other places is translated as sickness. For instance, if you go over to James chapter 5 and verse 15, is any among you sick? Same word. And the other word here that he uses before souls, discouraged in your souls, literally means to relax. To relax. And it's an interesting picture that Paul paints here. He says, consider Christ and all that he went through lest you become sick in your thinking and relaxed in your attitude toward God. Number two, inward iniquity. Verse four, you have not yet resisted bloodshed, striving against sin. The word resisted here is an interesting word too. It's a, it's a military term, and it literally means to set down troops against You have not yet set down your troops against sin. What does it take to set down troops? Well, we could be generic and we could say it takes a lot of effort. But I think it goes deeper than that, certainly. It takes a lot of purpose. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a, a mindset and an attitude. We can't just walk through life kind of... Well, we'll just take what comes as it comes. We have to be prepared. And there's really only one way to to be prepared when it comes to sin, because all sin begins in the same place. A lot of folks think it's part of that outward hostility. It's not. All sin begins inside of you with who you are. Go and put forward one book to James. For most of you, probably just a page flip. Chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot uh, be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It's a process. Just like spiritual growth is a process, growth in sinful behaviors is also a process. We become divided. You see, when part of you longs for something, when, you remember how we talked about the different parts of who you are? When one part of who you are, let's say the desire part, wants to go off and do these sinful things, and yet the mind knows it's wrong, what happens? We begin to, to divide. We become the two-minded man. We become the house that is divided that will not stand. We become the ship that is tossed to and fro on the waves of this immoral and corrupt world. Number three. Paul mentions the third hurdle. Outward hostility, inward iniquity, and then divine discipline. Divine discipline. He says this, 
And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. The word forgotten here is, is an interesting word as well. It literally means to be absolutely unaware and oblivious to some fact. You don't get there overnight. People don't, oh, you know what? I just remembered I'm a Christian. I'd forgotten all about that. I forgot I was supposed to attend the church, be part of the services. Go out and teach other people. I forgot all about those things. It's something that happens over the course of time. That's why I think Paul in this earlier section talks about relaxing in our minds and becoming sick in our thinking. Because it eventually leads to this point. Leads us to this point where we, we don't remember. But you see, God's a great God, is he not? When you forget, he'll remind you. I, I love my little smartphone. It's a, it's a great little device. And one of the reasons I love it is because I can put in my calendar these events. And, and me, I've got to program reminders. And I've got a list of reminders this long. It'll send me an email the day before. It, it'll give me a, a notification on the top of my phone the, the day of. Three days prior to that, it's doing all kinds of other things. Because I want to remember. It'll notify me. God does the same thing. He, he's going to help you remember. Now, you're not, you may not always like it. But he's going to help you remember. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, he says. To despise here is a word that means to make little of. To make little of. To take for granted, maybe, is the, the words that we would use to, to describe it in our day and age. See, sometimes we look at the trials of life and sometimes we look at that inward struggle and sometimes we, we look at how we're, we're perhaps being beat down and, and, and we see it as something that is part of this world. Part of all the things that just happen. We make little of it. And what would happen if we said, you know what? This is God reminding me. These things are happening to get me back. On track. Now, God has many ways of doing this. Your brother sitting next to you, your sister sitting next to you, it calls you up when you haven't been here for a while and says, Where are you? Many, many different ways. But God gives He gives four motives here, and you can you can search the motives out yourself. But he gives four motives as to why he, he disciplines us. First, he says, well, he's your father. And this is what fathers do. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. He's your father, down in verse 7, he says. Compares him to earthly fathers. This is what a father does. Then number two, he says, because God requires submission. It's not your will, it's his will be done. And the third thing is because it's brief. Hopefully God can correct us in such a way in this world that it will lead us to an eternity. Compare those two. And then finally, because it teaches us holiness. Verse 11. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It bears fruit. All of the hurdles bear fruit. I don't mean to be so generic in dealing with them. Certainly we could go on about each one of these. But we need to be aware of the fact that when we're trying to grow spiritually, these are the things... They're going to come up. That we're going to have to climb over. That we're going to have to claw our way through. In the latter part of this chapter, Paul focuses on the fact that the kingdom cannot be shaken. Matter of fact, that's how he ends the chapter. He talks about how the kingdom cannot be shaken. And the simple fact of the matter is, and the simple reason why he tells them this, is you can grow to the point 
By overcoming these things, you can grow to this unshakable level. Be part of this kingdom. If you endure. Look at verse 28, and then the lesson will be yours. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Do we? Are we facing the hurdles? Are we facing them putting our all in God and trusting in Him to help us overcome? Do we even have a relationship with Him so that we can overcome? If you're here this morning and subject to the invitation's call, the invitation to be one of His children, to allow Him into your life to be that Father who will help you along the way, we urge you to come. Hear His word, believe, repent of your sins, confess that Christ, the Son of the living God, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or maybe you just simply need to get back on that right path. Whatever your need, make it known as together we stand and sing.